I am so thrilled uh, to introduce you, Dr. Nancy Fulbright. In fact, every single one of our speakers is absolutely outstanding. Um, but I've been um, a fan of uh, Jennifer and Anne and Nancy for a long time. And those of you who have been in my classes know that uh, I always give you something from Nancy Fulbright to read. So let me read her bio now. Nancy Fulbright is Professor Emerita of Economics and Director of the Program on Gender and Care Work at the Political Economy Research Institute at the University of Massachusetts Amherst and a Senior Fellow of the Levy Economics Institute at Bard College in the United States. Her research explores the interface between political economy and feminist theory. I consider her the mother, one of the mothers of feminist economics with a particular emphasis on the value of unpaid care work. In addition to numerous articles, she is the author of The Rise and Decline of Patriarchal Systems, which I have bought and is by my nightstand, the editor of For Love and Money, Care Work in the US, and the author of one of my favorite books, Greed, Lust, and Gender, A History of Economic Ideas, Valuing Children, Rethinking the Economics of the Family, and of course, kind of the book that started it all, The Invisible Heart, Economics and Family Values. She has also written widely for a public audience, including contributions to the New York Times, Economics Blog, The Nation, and The American Prospect. And she does have a blog, and the address is in the program. Please welcome Dr. Nancy Fulbright. Thank you all very much. It's really, really great to be here and be part of this really rich and provocative conversation. I, I am, as you can tell from my, I hope you can tell from my cartoon, <coughs> excuse me, um, going to talk a little bit, focus a little bit on the economics of child rearing. Um, and this is because I think the production and the development and the maintenance of human capabilities is probably the most important part of our economy. And I would like to see us reorient our values and our priorities um, towards more consideration of it, um, rather than relying on typical measures like gross domestic product. So um, so reference before to thinking about children as part of the common good, uh, the vocabulary that economists sometimes use is public good. And a public good is something whose benefits are shared or diffuse or longstanding or difficult to measure. And I think the disjuncture between the private cost of children and the public benefits of child rearing is kind of key to the larger economic and, and demographic discussion. I, I will start with Elon, who I think is very good at uh, getting our dander up and getting our juices flowing. So here's this uh, famous recent Twitter, population collapse due to low birth rates is a much bigger risk to civilization than global warming. I think this is wrong. Um, and I think it also kind of hints at an underlying uh, suggestion that women who don't have babies are the real danger to the future rather than investors who are getting rich from carbon emissions, um, which I think is, is also wrong. I like this quote in a way because I think it highlights the link between below replacement fertility and global warming or climate change, which is that both are kind of the unanticipated result of failure to look beyond the market to the value of unpriced natural assets and services. In other words, I think they're both public goods and that's what they have in common and that's a connection that we really need to think about. So I'm going to give you just a very brief history of patriarchal institutions, which I think are really relevant to the overall narrative. Talk briefly about birth strike, although I feel like we've already covered the meanings of that to some extent. Uh, really focus on this economic question of expenditures on children. What are the private costs? And then end with some just some reflections about whether below replacement for the fertility is a mixed blessing um, or just a kind of a complicated one, which is, I think, what we're here to kind of ponder. So uh, I, I have 
uh, been long been really fascinated by the kind of economic and demographic history of um, the relationship between production and reproduction. And I do explore it in some length in my latest book, The, the Decline of Patriarchal Systems. Notice it's not the fall. Sometimes people hear this title and they change it to the rise and fall, as in the rise and fall of the Roman Empire. It's not the rise and fall of patriarchal institutions. It's the rise and decline. And that's because I think they have shown a remarkable persistence and resilience that's partly related to the issue that we're exploring today, which is their relevance to um, fertility and to families and to kind of our demographic uh, future. So um, I feel like the word patriarchy is often thrown around in political discourse without much attention to historical specificity or uh, origins or evolution over time. And that you know, taking it really seriously shows some pretty important patterns of overlap with other hierarchical institutions that are based on race, ethnicity, class, and other dimensions of group identity. And most patriarchal institutions have pretty strong pronatalist implications. They seem very closely connected to, uh, uh, to forced specialization in reproductive labor in specifically, and also sort of care labor uh, in, in particular. And I don't think we want to interpret these institutions simply as the result of some, some um, evil conspiracy. I think we have to understand why they evolved, what function they performed for the societies that developed them, and, and to really kind of uh, acknowledge the economic and political forces that contributed to their emergence and to their evolution over time. Uh, and I believe a lot of this has to do with the distribution of the cost of producing and developing and maintaining human capabilities, which, as I'm, I hope I'm going to persuade you, is, is not only really important, but it's also really, really expensive. So here's just a very, very, very brief overview of the historical narrative. In a lot of early mobile hunting and gathering societies, birth rates were pretty low, partly because you it's hard to move around uh, when you have babies and children uh, to carry. But it's also true that um, some hunter-gatherer societies developed uh, systems of raiding other groups, defending their territories, and raiding other groups uh, to seize women and young children and increase the size of their own groups. And it really seems like from the historical record that greater population size was often pretty functional for military strength. Uh, capturing women was, and capturing young women in particular, is a very, very cost-effective way of increasing uh, the size of the group. And also very consistent with establishing control over women within, uh, within, the, uh, you know, within the, the primary group. And what we see is that with the advent of private property and the transition to agriculture, uh, other forces come into play that are even more pronatalist, maybe having more to do with production than with military uh, advantage or, or political power. Uh, and uh, institutions developed that gave parents a lot of incentives to raise large numbers of children because they had control over property that gave them some leverage over the control of adult children. So the, I think the bottom line of this narrative is that patriarchal societies expanded um, at the expense of more egalitarian societies and be, you know, became very ubiquitous on a global level, although they evolved in very different ways according to different circumstances and in different, um, oh, you know, with different, in, in very, very different cultural and religious contexts. Let me just give you a feel for some estimates of the cost of children in the US. Not gonna go into a lot of detail, but happy to say more if you have specific questions or comments. So you may not know this, but the US Department of Agriculture is the agency that's in charge of looking at expenditures on children. And they publish on an, a regular annual basis uh, estimates. Uh, and uh, I, I don't really know what the historical origins of this are, but I think it's pretty hilarious that um, 
at some point in history, it was decided that children were actually an important crop and we should know how much is being spent on raising them. And uh, there's a wonderful artist, Anne Geddes, who, whose work you may have seen, that, who, and she photographs children in, as though they were little, you know, little, in a, little sprouts, little pupas. It's really great work. So that's kind of a, a take off on it. So here's the most recent USDA report, and I'm pretty sure a new one will be out uh, pretty soon. So it's called Expenditures on Children by Families in, in the year 2015. And the way they present the numbers are, first they tell you what the total is from, from age zero to age 17. What are parental money expenditures on the youngest child in a two-child married couple middle income family through age 17? That is one figure. That sum comes to $233,610. Big chunk of change, if you put that into your IRA instead of your kids, you could, you, you know, 18 years later, um, y y you'd be sitting pretty. The USDA also performs this estimate for uh, low-income families and for single parents, but I'm just providing this one estimate because it's easier to wrap your head around it. And uh, I can tell you a little bit more about how the estimate is is constructed, if you're curious. It's based on something called the Consumer Expenditure Survey. It's, it's, a, it's a very, very narrow definition of spending on children. It doesn't include the cost of pregnancy and childbirth. It doesn't include anything past age 17, the cost of college or any post-secondary training. Uh, it doesn't look at any transfers to children over 18, and yet we know that parents in the US in particular are often helping their kids out, providing housing or helping them buy a house or helping them um, in other ways. Uh, it, it, it doesn't include any of the cost of foregone earnings as a result of raising kids. And it, it certainly doesn't look at the cost of foregone leisure at all. So um, I think it's actually a somewhat misleading estimate and I've spent many years trying to arrive at better estimates that include some valuation of parental time. And I want to show you some uh, recent ones. And these estimates, too, are very lower bound because uh, what they're based on is an analysis of data from the panel study of income dynamics um, that I use because it's the only survey, literally the only survey in the US that collects information both on expenditures and on time use. So we can actually look at what it reports uh, uh, in terms of spending on children and what it reports in terms of time devoted to children. And so what I've done with my co-author is taken these numbers and matched the USD estimates uh, of, of consumer expenditures with the PSID data and then taken the number of hours that parents are devoting to childcare, both mothers and fathers in two couple families, I mean in two parent families. Uh, and, um, and, add, and then multiply that by what's called a replacement cost. And the replacement cost is just a very simple counterfactual. What would it cost you to pay somebody else to provide this care? And this is a very lower, lower, lower bound estimate. We just use the state level minimum wage. We use the state level minimum wage because so many states in the US have higher minimum wages than the federal, much higher. So it's more realistic to take the state uh, level minimum wage. Uh, and by the way, the state level minimum wages are actually lower than the cost of hiring a babysitter in most states. So they're not really high. In fact, babysitters now in the US today are earning between uh, 16 and $20 an hour, and the state level minimum wages are more, more like around $12 uh, overall. So just compare the um, USD estimate of cash expenditures for children ages 0 to 2, $12,589. And look what happens when we add in this very lower bound estimate of the value of parental time, $41,291. Okay, so um, let's say uh, you wanted to look at Romney's proposal for a $5,000 child allowance, uh, and let's just ask what, what difference that would make. Well, if you look at 
at the USD estimate, you'd say, wow, that's pretty hefty. But if you look at the total um, cash expenditures plus the value of parental time, it's about 12%. That's about what we tip a waitress. <coughs> Okay, so uh, it's a it's a very it's significant, but it it put in the context of this very lower bound estimate of the cost, which would be far higher, by the way, if we looked at opportunity cost, that is what wages foregone in the marketplace as a result. You can see why, um, you know, the bottom line is 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 that. It may look like gobs of money from a policy perspective, but from a parental perspective, uh, even very generous policies are not, are not really that generous. So this has really huge implications beyond thinking about things like uh, potential changes in child allowance or paid family leave. If you look at the child support obligations of non-custodial parents, they're all based on consumer expenditures, just on you know, what you spend on food, money, and clothing, with no consideration of the value of the custodial parent's time. If you look at public reimbursement rates for foster care families, they're just based on food and clothing with no reimbursement. Not surprisingly, rates are so low that there's a tremendous shortage of uh, foster families available uh, to take care of, of children in the US. It's really relevant to thinking about the economic disadvantage of single parent households who are not only getting less money spent on them, but have much lower levels of parental time for the obvious reason that there's only one parent there. So there's all this literature that, show, that suggests that uh, children growing up in single parent homes are disadvantaged above and beyond the economic disadvantages. Yeah, I, I'm sure that's true, but the economic disadvantages have always been ca couched in terms of family income and not in terms of family time. And if anything, the differences in the amount of parental time are, are even more significant than the differences in, in income. And, and then finally, it really leads this failure to value um, non-market unpaid care work uh, really understates, it, it really conceals, it camouflages the contribution uh, to public goods, the value of our collective human capabilities. And there's some very interesting research, which I can tell you m more about if you're interested in the, in the comments and questions on the public finance aspects of this, because um, as you know, children now are very likely to grow up to become taxpayers, you may not know, they're likely to become net taxpayers. That is, they're likely to be paying more in taxes than is spent on them as children. And uh, that means they're, you know, in a sense, they're sort of creating a, a kind of surplus. One way to think about this is, is to, um, I'll just, just a little sidebar from my slide. Um, think about uh, how social security works in the United States. You know, the social security benefits that you're eligible for are based on your record of participation in paid work and on your average earnings in paid work. And so if you're, if you're a taxpayer like me, that, uh, I have no children, who's raised no children, I'm eligible for fairly generous pension benefits on the basis of my earnings record, which has been largely uninterrupted over my lifetime, whereas my neighbors uh, next door who've taken considerable time out of the labor market and have raised five kids are receiving far, far lower social security benefits than I am. But guess what? It's the taxes that their children are paying that's financing my benefits. The system is funded largely on a tax on working age adults. So that's a really good illustration of the fiscal externality, the way in which we've socialized the benefits of children. Yeah, the more children we have, the more working age adults we'll have, and the easier it is to finance our social programs, right? But those who actually did the work of creating those future taxpayers are getting much, much lower net benefits from our system uh, than those who um, are not. Children are helping pay off our national debt, helping fund Medicare and Medicaid. And I think more attention to this fiscal externality could really help make the case for more public support for parents. 
in the US because as, as Andras was saying, there's this notion that children are just a private, they're like pets or a sports car. You know, you, you buy them, you take care of them, right? Because it's not apparent to most people uh, that they are also economically dependent uh, upon um, the future working age um, uh, generation. And in my view, yes, we should be thinking about effects on the birth rate as something we want to monitor. But a more profound concern is what are the implications for child poverty and the development of children's capabilities. In the US in particular, this is a really, really serious problem. We have a huge, huge inefficiency and in a lot of children in this country are growing up in environments where they have very little economic opportunity and very little, very inadequate support, and I think it's contributed to um, um, la lack of concern for families and for children. It is, has not only contributed uh, to a, a kind of under underproduction of, of human capabilities, I think it's also contributed a lot to the political divisiveness and anger and confusion that we're all dealing with. And this is why I think a better understanding of the process by which the gender contract and the, and, uh, and the child rearing contract gets renegotiated over time and the importance to keep renegotiating it in a better way um, is so important. So, so here's my final slide. Is it, yes, maybe to some extent a mis mixed blessing, but in my view, the environmental benefits of below replacement fertility are, are pretty important and pretty salient. They're two big unknowns. We don't know to what extent we're gonna be able to prevent or remediate climate change. And we also don't know the extent to which we'll be able to substitute robotic and AI innovations for human labor. Just, we, we don't really know. Um, below replacement fertility is certainly not the solution to global climate change, but I think it can really help in the short run. But the big, the the, the kicker is it can't last too long. Below replacement fertility can't persist too long. And if it happens at a really rapid rate, it's very, very economically destabilizing. So we need to be thinking about um, kind of the optimal path as well as the optimal level uh, of, of population, the optimal path to achieving that. And <coughs> yeah, okay, bottom line, I think I've already said this. I think it really requires some pretty serious thinking about what we sometimes call the social contract. And the sooner we begin thinking, rethinking this, the better. And this is why global climate change is a really important parallel because it can't, as with global climate change, we cannot deal with below replacement fertility with purely market-based incentives. It really requires a kind of rethinking about our common good, our common responsibilities, our common obligations. And um, somehow we have to craft uh, uh, an arrangement that creates more unity and more cooperation among ourselves, not just on the national level, but, but, um, but on the international level. Thank you. Oh, I got the microphone. Thank you very much for your talk. <clears throat> that was really fascinating. One note, though, when you were talking about the abortions, and you mentioned that um, in Hungary there's a limited access to abortion. Well, in fact, the thing is that uh, in a recent article, even the <coughs> American conservative paper criticized uh, Hungary that despite you know having this family-friendly policy I was talking about, uh, the uh, abortion uh, policy is very liberal, and personally, they criticized the um, uh, prime minister who uh, has recently uh, claimed that uh, he wouldn't like to change this um, uh, liberal abortion policy. The only thing uh, that came into the picture in September that, um, according to new law, life functions must be demonstrated to the mother before uh, performing the abortions. In, in fact, we call it, you know, the heartbeat law. And there was a huge uh, and, and massive um, demonstrations against that. But it's still 59% of the population uh, supports the current abortion law. 
And still, unfortunately, Hungary is still uh, on per capita rate, the fourth uh, in Europe uh, in performing abortion. So it's, even though it went down yep. for 90,000 to 22,000 this year, but it's still high and it's well, it, uh, still permissive. Yeah, I, I hear what you're saying, and I think it's important to put it in context. But I do, I do consider the requirement that a pregnant woman um, is forced to listen to the fetal heartbeat before a proceeding with an abortion, I do consider that a violation of human rights. Um, um, I, I know it's a, it's a big, it's a complicated issue for all of us. Hi, so thank you again for taking the time to discuss this issue. And I actually have two questions. So the first one is in regarding to uh, the need for foster parents. So what sort of recommendations would you give to the, I guess I'll start with the state level, to foster parents and, in, and increase, the, increase the reimbursement rate. Uh, and and I, if you're interested, I could give you some citations to research I've seen on the effect of increasing the, the reimbursement rate. I mean, it's basically, it's literally based on the consumer expenditure survey. What does it cost to feed and clothe a child? Which is not an adequate measure of, of true cost. It's very complicated. It's hard to actually figure out because every state is different and there's very little federal oversight of it. And just trying to figure out what different states do is kind of a, a, a complicated task. Good research topic. Thank you. And then um, I guess my second question, I don't, again, I don't know. I think it's, you may need, to, I guess there's more research that needs to be done on this, but what about parents of special needs children? Do you think that would impact the amount of compensation and time it would need to take care of them? Yeah, I think um, I think actually looking at the amount of time that's required to care for dependents is really important in setting reimbursement rates, and that, that's an issue that I think um, disability rights activists and and others uh, really care about. And I think it's it's really important to bring it take it under consideration. And this doesn't imply. It, by the way, that I think that just throwing more money at the problem will solve it. I think it's really important that you find a good match with foster parents. And foster parents have to have some pretty important intrinsic motivation to take on the responsibilities of foster care. But if they can't pay their own bills, if they can't, if they can't meet the basic needs of the children that they're caring for, I think that's a real disincentive. And that's especially true for those considering fostering a, a, a development, developmentally disabled or physically limited uh, child. I've got a question for you. I am totally with you that what we're seeing here is um, a real renegotiation of the contract about who's going to shoulder the costs, who's going to shoulder the price of uh, child rearing. And this is not just a renegotiation between men and women. It's a renegotiation between women and capitalism. It's a renegotiation between women and the state, as exactly. well as between men and women. But it's also true, as you're saying right here on the slide, right? This negotiation can't be based on purely market logic, right? right? But what other logic adjudicates all those many renegotiations between the sexes, between a form of, of, of economic um, system, right, such as capitalism, and then such as uh, the nation state and the interest the nation has in its perpetuation. Uh, yeah. at, and, we, and we sort of see this, may I just add, um, in the UK right now, right, is that they're, they're hitting such huge economic shocks now as a result <coughs> of what's happening in Ukraine that they are bailing on their commitments to the environment that they have previously made. It's, right. it's been really interesting to see this happen. Yeah, I hear, I hear what you're saying. And as you probably noticed, I often I often rely on market logic. I've spent a lot, lot of time like saying, you know, this is what it would cost if you pay, had to pay somebody else to, to do it. So I think 
we can use those tools and we should be using those tools. But I think, um, I think the human species is a, a turning point in its history where if it doesn't confront this question of thinking beyond the market, the market is gonna be extinguished because it is dependent on a matrix of, of commitments to our natural environment and our social environment that um, really can't be, a, be abrogated. Uh, and um, I think the analogy between the physical climate and the social climate is a really important one. In fact, I even had, I thought I had another, yeah, I even didn't get to my last slide. Um, if you think about you know, the US economy, it gets measured, our success, our cost benefit analysis, it's all about market terms, it's all about you know, dollars and cents, um, it's all about gross domestic product, but we could develop and we should develop and we are developing better social indicators and public health is one of those, it's a really important one and we learned during the COVID pandemic that it's something that we can measure and assess independently of it. So we could have a dashboard of indicators of our success in developing our common capabilities. And it could, could include things like child poverty rates, educational rates, public health, so forth and so on. And that it's very analogous to trying to develop indicators about the sustainability of the global climate. So just because it's not in the market doesn't mean that we can't measure it. It means that we have to measure it differently and that we need a bigger, broader, bigger, you know, more comprehensive dashboard. Although it's a big task, don't get me wrong, it's a big task to develop it. Thank you. Thanks so much, Nancy, brilliant as always. Um, I would love you to explain a little more your comment that the, um, low fertility or declining fertility is unsustainable? Well, if, if a population remains at below replacement fertility, basically it becomes extinct. Yes, just, that's just, if you, if every generation, well, yes we are, but that's why I think we don't need to worry about it so much in the short run. That's why I'm saying we can, we can embrace below replacement fertility as an uh, actually helpful economic and demographic goal, but we need to realize that at some point in the future, we are gonna have to restabilize the population, maybe at some constant equilibrium level that is environmentally sustainable. Well, it, no, it, it looks like a cylinder where the bottom bottom rows start disappearing. It starts looking like, in the very long run, below replacement fertility will look like that. You know, so right now we're worried about this vertical cylinder effect, and it's true, it's very challenging in terms of transfers to supporting the elderly um, with taxes on the working age population. Uh, becomes very problematic when it's like that. But if below replacement fertility continues, you have basically the point of the pyramid goes to zero. And it's, it, you know, that's what we mean by completely un unsustainable. And, but it's not that far away, I think, if you, if you look at like what the future of countries, demographic future right now of countries like Italy and Japan is, uh, you know, it's it's not like a whole lot more than 150 years before they would be basically gone. It that just over. <coughs> Poetic justice, yeah, you know. yeah. Um, thank you again for speaking. I just wanted to ask, do you think nations are ignorant to the effects of considering children a common good, as you say, or do you think that it serves some other um, national interests? I think it's just really easy to take for granted, take public goods for granted. 
just to assume that we've had them in the past and so we'll continue to have them in the future. That's why we have an environmental crisis is that we took these unpriced assets and unpriced services for granted. Like they've always been free before, so why should we worry about them? Um, it just falls into that category. I think Al Gore's term is really a good rhetorical flourish. It's an inconvenient truth to acknowledge it. And we're not very good as humans at accepting and addressing inconvenient and expensive truths. Hey, um, along that same line of questioning, I know that one of the things that um, Dr. Shubu was talking about on one of her slides was um, that one of the major reasons that people don't want to have kids is the cost of raising a child. Mm -hmm. Do you think if the research were accurate and the figures that you could just Google and see for the cost of raising a child included opportunity costs and the cost of time, do you think that would significantly increase how many people are scared of the cost of raising a child? Yeah, I do. <laughs> and then that that would then affect the fertility rate, I guess? Well, I don't know. I think um, I sometimes feel bad that I'm always emphasizing the costs of children uh, because I think it's really important to recognize that children have some really important benefits beyond their fiscal externalities. You know, like I think children teach us to, uh, I think they develop our capabilities for trust and understanding and cooperation and care for others. I think a lot of parents are at least partially transformed by the experience of taking responsibility for a person who is in need of care. And I think parenting is really key. Parenting, and I, when I say parenting, I don't mean, I'm not talking about parenting in the sense of being a biological parent. But I think the concept of parenting, like taking responsibility for, for, um, uh, for others, for, for people who, who really need your care, is really important to our concept of ourselves and our, our future. And um, I, you know, I think we should see support for parents as a way of honoring, not as a way of compensating them for on an hourly basis for what they do. No, it should be a way of honoring what they're doing, say, recognizing and saying, look, you're doing something that is contributing to our collective well-being, and we want to support you in this. Um, so, in a way, my argument is less about the cost of children than the distribution of the costs of children. Let's think about, I just want us to think about those, those together. I think, you know, as a society, we should keep on raising children. We should keep on raising children. Oh. Well, if not an idiot, if not an idiot, a sucker. A sucker. No good deed, no good deed goes unpunished. Exactly. And that's why this is such a spurious question, yeah. because clearly we need to redistribute the cost, right? As you're saying, we need to get the society to look at the Yeah. 
Actually, in my book, I try to use some game theory to explain the dilemma, and I think it is a dilemma. Um, it's sort of like, I mean, you could think of it as like the, the delicate negotiation that happens between two people. Like, should I say I love him or her, or should I wait until he or she says they love me? It's sort of like, actually, whoever says it first takes kind of a big risk, right? But no risk, no reward. Uh, it's a little bit like that. And the decision to have a child is a little bit like that. Like, do you want to have, shall we have a child together is a very laden question to even ask, right? And you don't know the answer to it. And it's become, it's just become kind of fraught. So you can see, I think, you can see like, one of the things that was kind of functional about a patriarchal system was that it kind of, it, it took a lot of decisions out of the realm of individual choice. It sort of coordinated everybody's behavior based on these very coercive expectations. And I think in, it, it was a very coercive system, but you can see how it simplified life. That we've, ch we've moved to this situation where anything goes, there are no norms, there are no real guidelines, and it becomes much more complicated to work it out on an individual basis without the lack of some shared understanding. But now I'm sounding too negative, and I, I, I just will just add one positive thing, which, which is that after 40 years of teaching students at the University of Massachusetts, I see a tremendous change in the younger generation. And it's not just that young women are less, um, or, or, or sort of more cautious and more skeptical about having kids. It's also that young men are much more willing to be engaged and to step up to family, um, at least to saying that they really want to embrace the role of being active and committed fathers. So I think there actually has been some uh, a collective kind of underground, kind of subterranean, implicit uh, renegotiation underway that is moving in a positive way. I don't know what other people, other people might have a better take on that than, than I do from my geriatric position. Uh, thank you for a, a really provocative talk. And I have a question that I think is to try to bring in more of a societal component. Um, because you had you know, what the USDA calculates and then yep. the, the yep. cost of parents' time. Um, and what about the costs of, at a minimum, health care for kids, education for kids? And yes, there's public education, but you know, there's more than just in the schoolroom. And I'm not a parent myself, so I'm sure I'm forgetting some obvious other things. But is there a way to explain to society those additional costs that also need to be paid to raise a child so that it's a healthy, capably yeah, that's child. Yeah, that's a great question. I think there is a way, uh, and that, in an ideal world, what I would like to have is a, instead of just a, a cross-sectional measure of what people are spending at a point in time, I'd like to have a life cycle analysis uh, that included a qualitative component. So it wasn't just looking at the numbers, but actually also involved, uh, actually talk, you know, having anthropologists collaborate with the statisticians in discussing this. Because I think the, a really important issue with the cost of parenthood is not just that there are costs, but that there are risks. That is, you don't really know what the costs are gonna be. Right? Like if your child has a disability, the costs are absolutely really exponential. Uh, if there's a change in, you know, if, if your partnership with a co-parent breaks down, that is very, very risky. And so there should be a way with life cycle data to actually estimate the, the, the risk uh, to somebody who makes a decision to become a parent. And I do think it's pretty clear that people don't really have a very clear understanding of what those risks are. Thank you for your talk. S speaking of the failure to account for the value of parental time, I was wondering 
if there is any thinking about other ways to compensate for that time, not in a monetary understanding of time, but how society can recognize the quality of time investment that parenting imply and, and give that back in other ways that yeah. are not necessarily economic. Yeah, I think one way is uh, uh, that, that we haven't really talked about that deserves some consideration is a commitment um, to provide economic opportunities for the next generation. That is like providing something like a baby bond. Everybody, every child that reaches age 18 should get this transfer, basically collective transfer. Here's your lump sum money to get started in your life. Um, what that does is it alleviates parental concerns about whether their children are going to grow up to be, you know, baristas for the rest of their life, right? Um, which is not a terrible, not a terrible destiny, but um, but as we saw from the discussion of why people don't have kids, a lot of it is very, it's a lot of it's not concerned for your own economic welfare. A lot of it's like, oh my gosh. What if I take on this responsibility and I'm unable to provide my children with the resources they need to actually survive in this hyper-competitive job market? So, yeah, I'm really glad you asked that question because I think that um, respecting and honoring parents in that way by providing greater, greater support for, for their, their children is also really important. Oh, so, um, so it's not necessarily a question. It was more of a comment uh, about what you had previously stated about how some younger generations are seeing this narrative as, a, oh, I should never have kids. It's only for, for schmucks. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I actually have two godchildren. So I can say that, that it's not necessarily people are saying that, oh, having kids is, is a dumb idea, a stupid idea. It's more of a, we're now aware of the potential yeah. costs, the, the, the sacrifices we have to make as parents. And, and as for, for guys, obviously I'm not a guy. So um, I, don't, I can only say from what I've seen from the outside, it's more, there's a change society in our generation that more men are realizing how much energy and sacrifices women have to take in order to raise a child and on, in some cases unfortunately they themselves came from a very difficult situation where they saw how much uh, time energy and suffering their mom as a single parent has had in raising them that they understand what it's like to be in that sort of environment and don't want to replicate that in future generations. So essentially it's more of a, they know, we know now what it's like and we want to ensure that the next generation doesn't have to yeah. endure that. Yeah. yeah, I think that's a, a good observation. And I think godparents are also part of the solution 